I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, AFOSR Spring Review. Uh, this is the second year that we've actually done this as an open review and not just closed to, uh, to government participation. And as Carlotta mentioned, we are going to be streaming live. So, uh, and if you're out there in the uh, streaming world, we've actually, if you go to the APN page, we actually have some vehicles associated with you able to be asked questions. What we'd like to do is limit it to more clarifying questions instead of probing questions. Uh, just to kind of keep things moving on schedule. We have lots of activities simultaneously going on with our scientific advisory board meeting this week. We have an advisory board that reports into Tom and I about where there might be some gaps in the portfolios. And, um, and then, of course, we have special guests here from, uh, from academia participating as well. So uh, um, last year we didn't start off with an overview of the portfolio and directions, and then that was requested by the advisory board, so uh, we'd start off today that way, uh, which was a good recommendation. So what I want to do is start off with, uh, and I'll try and cover this real quickly, because uh, you'll get a lot more depth and detail from each of the program managers uh, as we go through the week. So the AFOSR mission here really is to discover, sh uh, shape, and champion basic science for the United States Air Force. And so my viewpoint of that really is, is my role as managing the 6-1 program is to try and make today's Air Force and tomorrow's Air Force obsolete. And so what I mean by that is that those technologies are important for today, but what we want to do is advance technology fast enough that the things that we're currently doing today are no longer what the Air Force wants to do in the future. Okay, so we do that three ways. Um, the first one is that we find research, we fund research, and we basically transition research, basic sciences. So we try and identify and break through opportunity uh, here and abroad. So you hear from some of our international offices. AFOSR has uh, offices in London, Tokyo, and Santiago, Chile. Uh, we really are focused on the Air Force mission and the Air Force needs. So we try and foster revolutionary science in those areas. Important to the United States Air Force. And then transition technologies to DOD and industry and also to the Air Force and through different vehicles like the Air Force Research Laboratory. So I'd like to mention just a few things on transitioning science. This is a difficult thing to really measure. And so the way we view this is really kind of in a venture capitalist model. So the Air Force R's role here is to fund basic fundamental research. And to us, venture capitalists don't invest in that part of the business model, typically because there isn't a return on investment. So really for us, a transition is when others start investing in our science because they see there's an opportunity to actually have a new innovation or create some kind of an opportunity for the United States Air Force or for industry or for the society in general, that's a transition of science into uh, the next level of funding, which gives us the opportunity to advance and create new opportunities. All right, so AFOSR is actually one of 10 technical directorates. Um, most of these are located in Dayton. A few, a few of the uh, other directorates are located in Kirtland, so Directed Energy and Space Vehicles are located in, uh, in, Kirtland, uh, in Kirtland and Albuquerque, New Mexico. And information is located in Rome, New York. And then the munitions directorate is actually in Eglin, uh, at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. So of the 10 directorates, AFOSR's resp sole responsibility is to manage the basic science, or the 6-1. So the United States Air Force has set this up slightly differently than the other services. Uh, the other directorates manage the 6-2 and 6-3. And so part of this model we do is we fund about a third of our portfolio into the technical directorates of the Air Force Research Laboratory with the idea to build partnerships with our academic partners, the external community, to help this transition of science into the United States Air Force applications and needs. This, this allows the Air Force to have people who are technically in the same level of academia and can work in those partnerships to enhance our opportunities. Uh, there are a couple areas, you know, the Air Force Research Laboratory has core technical competencies. There are about 44 of those, and as you can see here, we have funded a host of different areas that are important to our technical directorates uh, in areas such as uh, scramjets, um, hypersonics research, higher quality imaging and RD for enhanced using of adaptive optics research. So a whole host of areas where we support the laboratory and we try and build those partnerships. Uh, we are also part of the overall DUD basic research envelope of, of funding, so it's not just the United States Air Force, but uh, our Navy partners, Army partners are 
also heavily involved in basic research as well as DARPA. And so what you see is the DOD's investment in basic sciences is roughly about $2 billion a year. And this is just in category 6-1, uh, does not include 6-2 and 6-3. And so we work cooperatively with, these other, with the other services and the other DOD components. At my level, we run, uh, Robin Staffen leads what's called the Defense Basic Research Advisory Group, uh, DBRAG. And so leadership gets together and we talk about how we actually deconflict things within the portfolio as well as where we go strategically as a department in trying to manage the overall enterprise. So at AFOSR, <clears throat> our budgets, uh, I think this is based on the uh, president's budget. Currently today is about uh, $364 million in what's our, considered our core portfolio and then about $140 million in the University Research Initiative portfolio. So that's breaking out, broken out in two different areas. So um, extramural research here is about $193 million. This would be our uh, combination of 6-1 and, I'm sorry, the core and the URI program. So about $200 billion goes out, out of house. Uh, we spent about 62 billion, uh, no billion, I'm sorry, million dollars. <laughs> I wish it was billion. It's a Freudian slip, yes. Uh, through funding research in the Air Force Research Laboratory, and then we also do some workforce development work in the research laboratory. We fund postdocs, summer faculty fellowship programs, and then we have, I think today, about nine centers of excellence. The center of excellence is really kind of a workforce development effort for the Air Force Research Laboratory, and what we do is we co-fund these, uh, split with the, uh, with the different technical directorates. These are set up at a university. There's typically some in-kind contribution from the university. And then what that does is it develops this relationship with uh, members of the Air Force Research Lab in developing new workforce as well, new, new technology areas. So uh, we also all pay some form of a, of a tax. And then, of course, there's some overhead to run the organization, which is about $35 million, not billion dollars, million dollars. And we've actually driven this cost down by more than 25% in the last uh, 18 months. So we've actually, this used to be about 48 or $50 million. So we've been actually doing efficiencies as well. And the last piece we'll, I'll mention, we'll talk about a little bit later, is we actually have an active international research program overseas. And uh, you'll hear about this a uh, little bit during the week. We actually reviewed the program managers um, Wednesday and Thursday last week as part of a separate review for the international portfolio. The directors of the offices will get up and give you some overview. Okay, so uh, what are some of the goals in, uh, in shaping the, the research portfolio? AFOSR really is focused on providing scientific leadership for the Air Force. Um, we want to track the nation's best and, and uh, the world's best SNEs to contribute to this endeavor. Ensure balance, so we're trying to ensure balance across the portfolio, so we, we very carefully balance what's executed in-house versus out-of-house and how much is actually uh, part of the workforce development portion of our investments. In fact, the workforce uh, development portions of our investments are growing. If our budgets would grow into 14, that's where most of the growth investments would be, trying to continue these centers of excellence, the postdoc programs, the summer faculty programs, and then we're also working with the, the technical directors to develop an IPA program where we could actually help enhance sabbaticals into the laboratory starting in fiscal year 14. So with that, we're trying to foster those connections and really here it's about driving to maximize the discovery potential for the future of the Department of Defense. And so really here, as I mentioned, my goal is to try and make today and tomorrow's Air Force obsolete through advancements in science. All right, so we get a lot of input into this, and this is just one example of the input that we use to shape our portfolio. So we get uh, some input from the department. Um, the Robin Staffen's office and the basic research office has identified what they have believed would be six potential disruptive basic research areas from metamaterials, cognitive and neurosciences, synthetic biology, quantum information sciences. These are areas where the department is currently holding workshops and has been engaging the community to identify where there are opportunities. We are, of course, also invested in these areas. And during that, through that DBAG, DBRAG process, we're actually making sure that there's less overlap between the services and we're doing it more collaboratively and cooperatively. So this is just one example of also input from we get from the Air Force. So the Air Force S&T had uh, developed Tech Horizons and in the Tech Horizons document, which you can get online if you just Google it. Um, 
there were four grand challenges, really looking at highly autonomous materials, how do we actually have resilient networks, uh, precision engagement or delivery in contested environments, and then can you actually have fractionated systems, maybe getting away from high cost platforms to lower cost fractionated and composable systems. There's other guidance we get from the United States Air Force as well. So the Air Force now has an S&T strategy, which again, uh, you could uh, find online. And then the current chief scientist, this was the previous chief scientist, uh, Dr. Mark Mayberry, who's with us today, has recently uh, put out what is called Hener Energy Horizons, which we again use for guidance and where there are opportunities in the United States Air Force. And then I think over the next couple of months, there'll be a Cyber Vision 2025 coming out of this office as well. And so we use that. So, Remember, we actually, the way the department is set up, you know, there are goals provided to the United States Air Force through the department. And then we actually take those goals, you know, decompose them down into problem sets that basic research can actually begin to address. And so our major mission is really to support the United States Air Force. And then again, there are these broad inputs we get from the department where they think there's some uh, disruptive opportunities which we follow as well. All right, so there are trends which are occurring in our portfolio, and I thought I'd spend a few seconds uh, just on some of these. You know, the budgets have grown over the last several years, uh, so we have not been getting out of a lot of areas. We have been reducing funding in certain areas, and I'll mention some of those uh, moving into the future. I won't go through them all, but there's, you know, hypersonics is clearly an Air Force-focused uh, technology area, which is important. Uh, moving into the future, we know we're going to want to fly high and fast. So you've got to look at problems like turbulence, air elasticity in a, high, in a hypersonics environment. We've uh, really plussed up our advanced mathematics portfolios, uh, high temperature superconductivity based on the discovery of the iron-based superconductors in China and Japan. Harold Weinstock has been you know, out for the search. Can we actually get to room temperature superconductivity? Uh, a lot of emphasis in the info assurance, network sciences, uh, uh, social cultural modeling, QIS, you'll hear about most of these today uh, or actually during the, during the week from the program managers. Um, other areas which that was really where we had started roughly uh, in increasing the portfolio in the 2009-2010 timeframe. So we've actually started moving you know, beyond these goals and areas like uh, physics and chemistry of surfaces in highly stressed environments. So can we actually begin to look at you know, things far from equilibrium as opposed to always being in equilibrium processes. Uh, there's a lot of interest in extreme optics, which would include areas like uh, ultra-high laser material interactions. Uh, there's a huge effort currently ongoing in Europe and other parts of the world. We're growing some of those same capabilities here. You'll hear about that in Rick Parr's uh, discussion uh, later in the week. And then uh, trans transformational computing, we really got to get beyond Moore's Law or there are other ways where we can begin to take advantage of things like neural computing. You know, clearly the brain is not a digital process, it's a combined process of chemistry, uh, analog, and so we bring together these multiple architectures to solve problems that are actually different in time and space, but we seem to be able to put those all together as a human. We ought to be able to figure out ways to advance computing beyond our traditional silicon-based computing. All right, so we've also taken on a, a, an initiative process over the last two years. Um, so we've started an initiative program, and so with this we're actually trying to begin to move about 10% of our portfolio into new opportunities and new research. Uh, program managers basically nominate these topics, they run through a, a review process, and um, in that review process in the end Tom and I select uh, different topics for new research areas. <laughs> And then really look at uh, uncertainty under complex engineering systems. 
So this year we just ran the, uh, the same process and uh, we've just recently approved nine new topics under this basic research initiative. These will be coming out in our BAA, uh, which will be published here shortly. If it hasn't come out already, I think it was supposed to come out last week, but I just haven't looked up to see if it did or didn't. So uh, you can see the list of different areas that we'll be looking for. You can find these online at the APAN uh, site as well. Uh, things like ultra scale and fault resilient algorithms, uh, foundations of energy transfer and multi-physics flow phenomena. And so uh, new areas that we're beginning to move into as a uh, as an organization to begin to uh, begin to address areas we think there are opportunities for the United States Air Force. All right, so uh, along those lines of future plans, we're going to continue to increase emphasis in this, this disruptive basic research areas. Uh, cyber and software is uh, clearly an area of importance to the United States Air Force. Uh, one area which we're going to go back to, which we haven't been involved in for the last couple of years, is really human performance enhancement, which is really about aerospace physiology. Uh, the United States Air Force used to have a strong lead in this area, but it has actually decreased over the last couple of years. And in the 6-1 program, it had pretty much come to an end. Um, <clears throat> given uh, opportunities that exist today, we think really this is an area the Air Force should be leading. And if that's the case, we should really have a strong basic research program in this area as well. Uh, another area which we're going to regrow a little bit, which uh, has been actually been uh, kind of stable and flat for the last five years is structural materials and mechanics. This really is an area which is a foundation to the Air Force as well as the other services, but these emphasis areas have begun to, you know, effectively erode some of these traditional science areas in our portfolios, not because they're not important, but because with the increase in budgets moving to new topics, when you flatline over a five-year period, just based on inflationary growth, they begin to decrease. And so we're going to try and put some emphasis back in that. So areas we're going to decrease, uh, bioenergy, biofuels. Uh, we've a, we've, we've uh, actually led a lot of areas here in the algal fuel work and other areas. There's a lot of research currently be done, being done by DOE and other organizations. So we're going to back away from some of this work. We're going to try and follow it. We'll stu still do some of the enzymatic fuel cell work we've been doing, but we, don't, we think there, we, it's really important for us to pick some of these other topics that maybe be more important to the Air Force, and truthfully, that portfolio will be moving into the aerospace physiology efforts. Other things which we think are time to begin to evolve beyond is we still do a lot of work in CMOS electronics, so we're going to start reducing the CMOS electronics work. Uh, we've had a great success in self-healing materials and adaptive materials. We'll continue to do this. Les Lee will present some of this work, but this will become more of a flat line and, and less of a, of a growth area for us as we move forward. And then uh, a lot of the thermal setting polymer work, we're going to start redirecting into new areas. All right, so in my last 10 minutes, let's just, you know, let's touch the portfolio slightly. Today, we are actually organized based on three technical directorates within AFOSR, the Aerospace Chemical Material Sciences, Physics and Electronics, and Math Informational Life Sciences. I'll tell you, we're in the middle of doing a reorganization. Next year, it will be different than what it is today. You'll get the review today will be based on where we currently are organized and structured. Uh, you can see roughly the portfolio is divided up about a third in each one of these areas. And then, of course, we have our university research initiatives, uh, which supplement our current core, pro our core programs. So I won't go through details just for the sake of time. Uh, well, these are in the order you'll hear about them this week. So the first two days after we go through uh, some of the higher level reviews by the directors, uh, you'll hear about math information and life sciences, uh, I think the rest of the a this afternoon and all day tomorrow. Uh, the focus areas we have within this are the information and complex networks and some of the subtopics are things like science of cybersecurity, software and algorithm uh, algorithms for advanced computational architectures, Another focus area for us is decision making. So you hear about trust and autonomy from Joe Lyons and some human machine interface work as well from Jay Muhn. Uh, dynamic systems and optimization control. So dynamic data driven control is one area with, which, uh, which uh, Dr. Darima will talk to you about as well. And then of course we've always had a strong effort on natural materials and systems and looking at things like bio-inspired materials, bio biosensing and extremophiles, trying to understand how nature has evolved over time and is beginning to deal with some of these problems. Uh, this is just a, a quick review you'll find from the agenda you have and the presenters in these different uh, 
in these different portfolios. So we really focus on that later this morning and then moving into the afternoon. And then this, orga this organization will finish up uh, by the end of the day on, uh, on Tuesday. Physics and electronics will move to on Wednesday. Uh, again, uh, the focus areas here are complex electronics and fundamental quantum processes. So you hear about a lot of ultra cold atom work, dielectrics and magnetic materials, and nonlinear optical materials and optoelectronics. Uh, the other, fo other two focus areas are plasma and high energy density non equilibrium processes and optics, electronics, communications, and signal processes. So you'll hear about information fusion, uh, cold dense degenerative plasmas, and so the portfolio is, is fairly broad, and the program managers will come up here and give you an overview of their strategies and, and the efforts that they're work, currently working. And again, this is the agenda which you have. If you've checked in, it's also online on the APAN, and on that APAN page, you can also download those presentations by just clicking the, the name of the portfolios. Uh, last one you'll hear, and we've kind of reversed the order from last year, uh, Aerospace Chemical and Material Sciences Directorate has three focus areas, the air structure interaction control, energy power and propulsion. Even though we're moving beyond, you know, out of some of that bioenergy, biofuels work, we still have an interest in, for the United States Air Force, about energy power and propulsion. Particularly in propulsion, the United States Air Force leads in combustion and, and turbine engine work and how we actually support those areas. Topics like thermal science, system system level analysis and modeling, and of course energetic materials uh, is important as well. In the air structure interaction control, you hear a lot about unsteady flows, uh, hypersonics, looking at low, low Reynolds number of work as well. And then a complex materials and structure, you'll hear about reconfigurable structures, multifunctional materials, and basically how do we get beyond just thinking about materials as two-dimensional, one-dimensional, how do we understand them in 3D plus N dimensions and functionality. And again, this is just an overview of that agenda that we'll be, uh, be covering in the later half of the week. And uh, I think this is primarily uh, Thursday and Friday morning. All right, so uh, just to bring this you know, closer, to, closer to closure, the education programs, we actually have a significant number of education programs even beyond the, uh, the uh, centers of excellence and summer faculty and postdocs. We work with the Army, the Army's actually the uh, executive agent for the Department for uh, uh, the Historically Black College and University Minority Institution Program. In addition to that, AFOSR has its own internal set-aside, which we manage for HBU SMIs. Uh, we run a series of capstone programs, everything from nanosats, and then we also do some uh, high school, junior high school, high school outreach uh, programs. The postdocs and summer faculty mentioned, we support efforts at the United States Air Force Academy, trying to make sure cadets actually get research experience uh, during their time there. There are four centers. Uh, we also fund work at AFIT, which is a, a mass, primarily a master's granting institution in the Air Force that does do PhDs as well. Uh, we support that again to try and give members of our military opportunities to do basic hands-on research and, and get a knowledge of, of science. And then we've recently added a visiting scientist program where we are actually paying for researchers from Air Force Research Laboratory as well as our program managers to hopefully do sabbatical assignments in the academic institutions, trying to refresh some of their skill sets and then also help enhance and, and, and grow their collaborations. A couple things we run for the department. We are uh, basically the executive agent for the NDSEG Fellowship Program. This supports about 600 PhD graduate students in fields related to what the department's interested in. And then we also have an Assure program, which is tied to the NSF REU program, research experience for undergraduates. Uh, this is to actually have some REUs that are actually focused more on, on DOD interests. And this brings students from, say, liberal arts colleges that don't get hands-on research experience in their institutions to research granting institutions uh, to uh, get some exposure to maybe potentially uh, be interested in science and engineering from a from a research perspective or a career perspective. Many of the students in this area, I went to one of these colleges um, in my graduating class, the 28 chemistry majors, 25 of them went to med school and dental school. Three of us became uh, scientists in, in traditional fields. So there's an opportunity here, I think, to actually capture some of those as part of our workforce we need to work harder at. The International Enterprise, you'll get some overviews uh, from this, but as I mentioned, AORD or NESORD, Again, we're looking for basic research across the globe. Um, budgets are broken down here. We have some AORD 
uh, support, which is what we fund uh, primarily through uh, my core program, and then there's research, which is again supported through the Air Force Research Laboratory primarily. You see the same thing in EORD and in SORD. Again, this is where we're trying to outreach to the communities across the globe to develop relationships and enhance our overall portfolio. Um, I'll skip this, in this for the sake of time, but we've, we've been transitioning things back through these programs over the years. Uh, some of the add a second laser work done in this country today was uh, you know, brought back through some collaborations or enhanced through some collaborations in Europe as an example. All right, so why do we do this? Because you, know, you can see a lot of people pro show, put up these view graphs related to R&D spending across the globe. And even though the R&D spending over the last decade has actually grown by almost 100%, um, uh, what you see is that the purchasing power of the United States dollar in science actually is declining against the, in the investments across the world. And so we've actually uh, put together one of these recently and doing some literature searching on articles. And what you see is back in 2000, the United States, you know, just through publications and things like science citation, uh, doing science citation index and others, you know, was about 26% of the world's publication and in, in journals, and so you see over a 10-year period, this is beginning to, to decline as other areas, primarily Asia, begins to grow in its, in its publications and its work that it's currently doing in, in basic research. And so we think this begins to reflect a little more about the science base, the R&D funding model that people show, typically actually includes what we would call 6.4, which is more of that later development. Um, <clears throat> and so I often get lots of questions, what does that really mean to the 6.1 portfolio? So we started looking at other other ways we can look at it that we could try and get a better sense of, of what's going on based on a basic research uh, perspective. And so you see areas which are emerging too, the investments here in South America. I also get questions, why have a South American office? And there's a lot of investments in Brazil and other countries where they're trying to grow research capabilities today that didn't exist you know, 10 or, or 20 years ago. All right, so just to quickly summarize, I think we are continuing to uh, discover, shape, and champion basic science. Uh, we have lots of examples where we have actually profa profoundly impacted the Air Force of today through technologies or science which was invested many years ago. Sometimes it was only a year ago. Um, so we are supporting world-class basic research across the globe. I think we are educating future scientific leaders, um, not only in the United States Air Force, but also in academia and other institutions. I think we are providing a meaningful transition. It's very difficult to say, you know, what, you know, specific technology or science you invested in, what was the outcome of that product from a product perspective. Many of us begin to invest in different pieces of this. That knowledge collision that occurs really creates those innovations and opportunities later. Um, we're trying to enhance an overall understanding of AFOSR, our roles, missions, and programs, which is why we've opened this up, which is also why we've uh, we use stream and we're trying to engage the broader community so that everybody understands what AFOSR does, the kind of work that we're interested in, and then how do we improve that engagement and relationship because that's really what drives you know, the potential future for our organization. And then ensure current investments are fully coordinated and we do this because we need to coordinate with what's important to the Air Force and how do we take the opportunities with that and leverage that and begin to, on some people don't like the word, but exploit the science to create innovation. That's what venture capitalists do. They want to exploit what you do in scientific work to create some opportunity so there's a return on investment so they can actually do a business model that says, you know, there's a value to this and that's really what we're trying to create is that foundation. So with that, I'll, I'll end. Uh, I'll do two quick advertisements and then I'll take uh, a question or two even though I have a minute left. So this is the 60th anniversary of AFOSR as well. So that was actually on October 12th of 2011. We've been doing a year-long celebration. We'll do a, a larger event next October, uh, coming up in October. But Tuesday night, uh, here in this room, Chad Merkin, uh, who is a PCAST member, will actually be here to talk to us about uh, nanotechnology and moving beyond small-scale thinking. So I encourage you all to, uh, to attend that. And then uh, we are out there trying to engage so you can find the information from today on APAN, you uh, can follow us on Facebook, you can Twitter with us, and, uh, and there's a lot of information. All the things we're doing now, we're trying to post on YouTube so that you can begin to see what's going on, even if you're not here participating in person, or if you can't do it in one of these weeks, you can do it in a, in a prior, you know, later on week. So with that, I'll end, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them.